Good evening. My name is Dave Dubois, and as you can see by what you're looking at on your slide, I am not Sharon Reed. Uh, I can only hope and dream that one day I will be that good looking, but for now, you're stuck with me. Unfortunately, Sharon had a death in the family, which she had to attend to, so she couldn't join us here tonight. So our hopes and prayers to Sharon and her family. It is my duty now to call this annual meeting of the Howard County Historical Society to order. I am going to share with you some notes that Sharon has shared and asked me to present to you. So I am going to read that on her behalf. 2020 has been a year like no other. When I think back to 2018 and 19, I could say the same thing just different circumstances, more personal to me. By March of 2018, there had been four instances where I had nearly died. For those who know me, I cannot separate myself from God's grace in my life. And one thing I know, in spite of all that comes in our lives, there is purpose for our good. Whether in our personal lives or in the life of the Howard County Historical Society, 2020 presented an opportunity for next level thinking, planning, and implementation to achieve that purpose. At first, I reflected on what I was to share during our annual meeting. There were many thoughts I referenced from my first year as the president. It is a sink or swim moment. Next level thinking was required. Two main points. The first was I was grateful and humbled by the thought of Dr. Catherine Hughes finding a way to Howard County Historical Society interviewing with a mask, not seeing the faces of her interviewers, and accepting the position anyways. And secondly, I was beset by questions like, how do we stay relevant during this pandemic and the unrest in our country and protect our largest historic relic? In spite of everything, we needed to stay above the fray. And as we moved through the year, the need for our next level planning stretched our new executive director, our officers, our board members, committees, staff, and volunteers. Decisions like what projects and events do we work to salvage and what projects do we postpone or cancel? It involves strategic thinking and out of the box brainstorming. I am grateful for our board of trustees and their gifts and talents as well as their willingness to go with the flow. Many have put in countless hours of volunteerism during these unprecedented times. We know we must continue to plan at the next level. Finally, without next level implementation, planning is fruitless. During the recent term, we have updated our mission statement to be inclusive of the entire community that we serve, to be more intentional about including the history of all people of Howard County. As we look to assure the relevance of our future historical society, it is imperative we continue to implement our long-range planning goals. One of them is to integrate our young people, African American, Asian, Latino, and all other ethnicities, not only by inclusion in the historical archives and exhibits, but by inviting them as Howard County Historical Society members, as participants on the Board of Trustees and its committees, and as partners and collaborators. We must listen to the voice of our membership and the community. In closing, as we meet here via Zoom, we are literally living in a virtual reality. We are overcoming. Consider these five leadership lessons from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One, summon your courage. Two, tell the unarmed truth. Three, get comfortable with discomfort. Four, be optimistic, and five, lead with character. With the support of the board and all our members, I look forward to serving this organization for another year as president. I know it will be challenging as well. Thank you for supporting the Howard County Historical Society. If you are not a member yet, we invite you to join us and add your talents as we work together to preserve the history of Howard County. Sharon Reed.
I'm bringing the minutes of the Howard County Historical Society annual meeting, October 17th, 2019, in Continental Ballroom. Board President Dean Despinoy called the annual business meeting to order at 6.07 p.m. Bill Menges presented a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the 2018 annual meeting and approve them as presented. Randy Roosh seconded the motion and it was passed by voice vote. On behalf of the Board Development Committee, Chris Whistler presented the following nominations for re-election to the Board for three-year terms. Linda Ferris, Mary Ellen Harnish, Peggy Hobson, and Kathy Stover. He also presented the committee's nominations of Peter Inman and Teresa Fields for three-year terms. Dean asked for additional nominations from the floor and none were offered. All nominations were accepted by voice vote. President Despinoy recognized retiring trustee Judy Brown for her service and her leadership. Judy Brown presented the Mary Ellen Harnish Distinguished Service Award to Peggy Hobson for her many years of work on behalf of the society. The annual meeting was adjourned at 6.20 p.m., after which the attendees enjoyed a program featuring Doug Pakanga, Community Programming Manager for the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma's Cultural Resource Extension Office in Fort Wayne, as well as a mock trial examining the legend of the Miami headman known as Makoko Ma. Having heard the minutes of the 2019 Historical Society annual meeting, I will accept a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. second. Any discussion, edits, adds? Hearing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. Hearing none, Motion passes. Okay, the development, the board development committee. Can you hear me? Okay. The board development committee would like to make the following recommendations. Uh, the people that would be going back for an additional three-year term would include Chris Whistler, Lynn Smith, Dave Du Bois, and Randy Rush. Taking over for a term for Nita Campbell would be Judy Brown, and we have two new candidates that would start new three-year terms, this being Corey Wood and Reverend Mike Carson. So we would like to recommend that. Hearing the slate of candidates, for the next board class, I will accept a motion to accept the slate in a second, and a second. Anybody from the floor want to add anybody to this slate? Hearing none, again, all in favor of this, these three separate groups in our next slate of candidates for the board, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, the slate's passed. Randy? The board development committee, uh, along with the executive committee, would like to recommend for our slate of officers for 2021 the following group of candidates. For president, Sharon Reed. For vice president, Dave Du Bois, for secretary, Linda Ferries, for treasurer, Chris Whistler, and for member at large on the executive committee, Larry Hayes. Again, this comes as a motion from the board. We will accept a vote of aye for those in favor of the slate of officers for 2021. Aye. Any opposed? Same side. And hearing none, we have elected the slate of officers as well. Thank you, Randy. At this time, I'd also like to recognize our outgoing board members. 
We have four, Marcia Santon, Linda Clark, Nita Campbell, and Dana Osborne. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I'd like to say thank you to those four individuals for their dedicated time, effort, love, and, and all of themselves that they put into their time on this board. Uh, we thank them very much here going forward and wish them nothing but the best. And with that being said, I, it is my privilege to adjourn this meeting, business meeting of the 2020 Howard County Historical Society annual meeting. I think I need a motion for that to adjourn. So moved. So moved. We got a second. Second. And all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same side. Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Good evening. What can one say about 2020 that hasn't already been said? Uh, it was definitely a strange year to take on a new position. Uh, it was a year of contrasts. Museums and historical societies were hit hard. Seismic shifts uh, will be felt for years by many. Many large museums closed temporarily and laid off staff. Small organizations with less overhead to carry, like Howard County Historical Society, were able to fare better. Everyone, though, struggled to carry on and create a new normal. It happened that sometimes the new normal made one rethink the old normal, not necessarily a bad thing. It is not often that you can take the time to question why things are done in the way they are, but it is usually helpful, and in two, 2020, we were pushed to do so. While marking a year of changes, the annual report of the Howard County Historical Society for 2020 shows mostly good news. First and foremost, we ended the year in the black. I can report that our net income was $26,636.21. That figure shows the strength of support that the Historical Society received from donors, members, sponsors, endow endowments, granting organizations, and federal aid. CARES Act funds were crucial to help sustain maintenance costs, some of the grants and donations received in 2020 will go to support projects that will be carried out in 2021. 2020 began without a hint of what was to come. Dave Broman was in his eighth year as executive director, contemplating retirement. Heather Fouts was beginning her new position as office manager and bookkeeper. Bill Baldwin and Jill Snyder were leading efforts to clean up after Christmas. Randy Smith and Gail Leiter were busy with archives and collections. Stu Lauterbach was making a gigantic to-do list for 2020. Board President Sharon Reed was just beginning her term and getting the Black Women of the Midwest Revisited program ready for March 15th. Then, boom. The museum closed March 20th. The office closed. However, while everyone was staying home, a job search committee was forming and began the daunting task of replacing Dave Broman. And that is where I come into the story. I was hired and began at the Historical Society on May 13th. Though not necessarily optimal timing, I was thankful to be hired during a pandemic when others that I knew were losing their positions. I have enjoyed this process of getting to know the organization, its collection, buildings, and especially staff, volunteers, and board members, and the history of Howard County. Living in nearby Hamilton County, I only had a few sparse facts about the area. 
I'm learning my way around Kokomo, meeting community members and leaders, and importantly, finding where to get the tastiest chocolate cake. The pandemic has challenged my ability to experience local restaurants, uh, and I do look forward to the opportunity to grab a drink or a coffee with new colleagues and friends. I've had to get to know people by their eyes. Uh, I have yet to see a number of people's noses or mouths. But very quickly after I was hired, we all jumped into the business of the Howard County Historical Society. We hosted the Indiana Historical Society's traveling exhibit, securing the vote, women's suffrage in Indiana in July. In August, we piloted a new program, the automobile scavenger hunt that highlighted our automotive artifacts, had touchless activities and took place outside. We adapted from the dark pages that would be now performed outside on the mansion porch, lawn, and garden. That was in October, and with the challenge of Christmas at the Cyberling, with its traditional crowds, and with the challenge of all of those people together, we created a virtual tour, and we limited in-person attendance through time tickets. While not necessarily an Oscar contender, the Christmas video tour garnered thousands of views from all over. The annual report lays out the activities of 2020, and now here we are in 2021. We continue to keep safety front of mind as we plan. The mansion and museum will reopen in February after a thorough teardown and cleaning from Christmas. Hall of Legends will be presented virtually on March 18th. The video will go up on our Facebook page. Later in the year, we will be adding exhibit elements to the Cyberling Mansion kitchen in a reinterpretation of this area. Curator Stu Lauterbach and I have been working with an African-American advisory group so that we might tell a fuller story of African-American history in Howard County. And we are mindful of offering digital programming during this time. The end result will be the installation of a digital storytelling experience and exhibit. We are highlighting several people, places, and milestones in African-American history in the county. And visitors to the museum can get more information via a QR code on exhibit labels in the museum, while visitors to our website can access the information as a virtual experience. We are working towards an opening sometime in late February. Stay tuned. We will commence an oral history collections project soon. Voices of the pandemic and protest is an effort to capture the experience of people in Howard County in this year of COVID-19 and social unrest. We received a grant from the Indiana Historical Society to collect stories from a diverse set of people across age groups, socioeconomics, and race. People on the front line, like medical and emergency workers, as well as grocery workers, teachers, and students, people impacted by illness and death from the virus, as well as those impacted by protests across the country. 2020 did not spare many people feelings of isolation and uncertainty. We've collected a ventilator made here in Kokomo by Ventec. We will be collecting masks and other objects that represent these stories. Watch our social media for updates. In 2021, I hope to bring my museum philosophy and vision to bear on the historical society's long range and interpretation plans. Connecting to the community is crucial, and I want to build on all that has been done before here at the Historical Society. We have to make sure that what we do is relevant to the people of Howard County, solving problems and contributing to the quality of life here. While stewardship of our collection and buildings are key to what we do, there is enormous potential to grow 
through outreach and collaborations with other community organizations. We are moving towards changes in our exhibition methods to become more participatory, thought-provoking, even emotional, and presenting history from multiple perspectives. It's going to be an exciting year. We are also undertaking repair of the Cyberlings Port Cochere, the covered area on the west side of the mansion. This major project will require your continued support. I look forward to meeting more members and continuing to develop my work with the Board of Trustees who do a lot of the heavy lifting around here and ensure the Historical Society's longevity. I want to thank the staff and volunteers who have been so supportive in this first year. And I especially want to thank Sharon Reed, board president, who has shepherded me through my first year on the job. Her wit and wisdom are invaluable. Thank you. And now I want to introduce um, two folks who have stepped in to help us tell the story of Mrs. Aleph Henley. Please welcome Gia Hardiman and Mike Carson. Thank you, and hello. I'm Gia Hardiman Eddington, and I'm Mike Carson. We are stepping in for Gil Porter, a local history writer who is unable to join us tonight. He wanted to share that he is glad that we have a chance to communicate this story about Miss Aleph Henley, an African American pioneer in Howard County, who he has been researching for over eight months. Here's the presentation. Next slide. 2019 was the 175th anniversary of Howard County. That year, the Historical Society and the Kokomo Early History Learning Center worked with many Native American and other organizations to re-examine the historical record and update the county's history accordingly. This led to several significant new stories about the origins of Kokomo and Howard County. The most visible result was we were able to update the official history page on the city of Kokomo's website, thanks to generous support of Tom Tolan. In 2020, the Howard County Historical Society Publication Committee wanted to re-examine African-American history here, thank you. Howard County's two 19th century American settlements. The Bassett Settlement and the Rush Settlement are well known. Bassett in particular is well documented. So we started by researching the Rush Settlement, which is older and smaller than Bassett. Reviewing the records of the tiny Rush Cemetery in Irvin Township led to the uncovering of a remarkable African-American pioneer whose life story is an exact, exciting and inspiring addition to our Howard County history. Her name was Aleph Henley. Here is the HCHS board president, Sharon Reed, at her grave with a still clear and beautiful headstone. Next slide, please. What we found was that the historical record for Mrs. Aleph Henley is solid and stunning. Appreciation goes out to the Kokomo Howard County Public Library staff for their help in this research. For example, her purchase of 80 acres in Irvin Township in November 1844 is clearly marked here in this land sale. This is the earliest record of an African-American 
purchasing land in newly formed Howard County. Mrs. Henley was the first, but she was far from the last. Other African Americans soon followed, buying land around the same time, including John Hardiman, the ancestor of the current Hardiman family in Kokomo. Mrs. Henley's daughter, Lucinda, was married to the Reverend David Rush, the namesake for the settlement, which was settled soon after. Rush was farming land just to the east of his mother-in-law property about 1845. Another important document relating to Mrs. Henley at this time is a deed in the recorder's office in January 1851, Mrs. Henley deeded part of her land to start the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the county. This church family eventually involved in today's Wayman Chapel AME Church in Kokomo, making it one of the earliest churches in our community. So Mrs. Henley's contribution to Howard County history would be impressive with these records alone. We can, however, trace her travel from the eastern United States thanks to census records, and we were naturally curious about her life before she migrated to Indiana. But we were completely unprepared for what we found next. Next slide, please. Mrs. Hanley was born into the shackles of slavery sometime around 1765 in Virginia. This is the image of the record of the North Carolina court approval for her manumission from enslavement in 1801. Her young son, Case, was also named in the document. A more recent discovery is her name in Virginia Beach court records from 1779, which listed her as a taxable property of Mary Fentress. There is much we still want to learn about this period of her life, but the later documentary evidence connects Ms. Henley to prominent Quaker families in and around Randolph County, North Carolina. Two Fentress brothers are responsible for submitting the manumission petition in North Carolina. What we do not know are the circumstances of how Mrs. Henley got to North Carolina from Virginia. But once there, she seems to be closely affiliated with a prominent white Quaker family named Henley, which apparently accounts for how she acquired the surname. Still, many details hidden from view waiting to be revealed. Next slide, please. While mysteries remain in Ms. Henley's story, the simple outline of her story is compelling. She was a free woman of color, once enslaved in the East, who arrived in Howard County and paid cash money in full for 80 acres in Irvin Township. Then she later deeds part of that land to a church. From Virginia to North Carolina to a farm in Howard County, the story of Ms. Aleph Henry is simply all inspiring. Her legacy is a vital part of Howard County, its story. As we wrote in the Footprints cover in August 2020, she was born a revolution and then died the year the Civil War started. Her life is a tribute enduring human spirit and preservation spanning the epic of American history. We are so honored to have Ms. Henley as part of our Howard County heritage. We look forward to sharing more details about her life in the future. There's more to discover. Thank you so much for your time.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Inman. I'm a member of the Howard County Historical Society. Tonight, I will be playing the local Alex Trebek as we conduct a Howard County Jeopardy. Our participants tonight, we have in the middle, Cheryl Griffin, Community Resources Director and AFL-CIO Labor Activities Director at the United Way. Closest to me, we have Paul Wyman, Howard County Commissioner and owner of the Wyman Group real estate firm. And farthest from me, we have Mr. Tom Tolan, Community Planner in the Department of Development for the City of Kokomo. Here are today's categories. Home sweet home. Gotta make money. Who is that? Politics. What a mix, also known as potpourri. And location, location, location. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> would, anybody like, would anybody like to volunteer to select our first category and price? Cheryl should go first. I will select testing, location, testing. location, location for 200. This is the road on which Elwood Haynes made the first, car, the first drive of his car, the Pioneer. I think that was Mr. Wyman. That would be Pumpkin Vine Pike. That is correct. That is 200 point or $200 for Mr. Wyman. Yes. There's my one for the night, guys. Okay, good. <laughs> the board is yours, Mr. Wyman. Great. Um, I will take, um, who is that for 100? This Kokomo author and illustrator is the father of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Mr. Mr. Tolan. Who is Norman Bridwell? Very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a hundred bucks. Oh, oh. <laughs> Mr. Tolan. Yes. Who is that for 200? Eleanor Stein was the first female judge in Howard County and also worked early in her career with this effort, which produced the first atomic weapons. Paul, you got this. <laughs> first, uh, uh... Yeah. The answer we were looking for was the Manhattan Project. Ah, very good. I didn't uh, Mr. Tolan, the board remains yours. Oh, who is that for 300? Here we go. <laughs> this actor had a failure to communicate with Paul Newman's character in the movie Cool Hand Luke. I forget, I know. Wow. Aaron Kokomo, huh? <laughs> Tom. Who is Scruther Martin? Correct. Thank wow. You. Wow, Ooh. that's impressive. That's Thank impressive. you. Thank you. It was either that or Scatman Scruthers. I wasn't sure. Oh, my. Okay, let's so go with who is that, Peter, for 400 This person had to raise the money twice to finally build the Carver Center in 1947. Yes. Yes, who is Reverend Perry? That is correct. Thank you. I know it is. All right. <laughs> let's go. Wow. Big money. Who is that? 500 Aleph Henley was the first African American to do this in Howard County in 1844. Tom, weren't you paying attention? I, I okay. Buzzed. Who? Uh, who? Uh, what was uh, own land? Correct. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Reverend Carson. All right, that'll do it for our "Who Is That" category. Location, location, location for 100, Peter. <clears throat> High Street originally named by David Foster, was renamed this in 1908. Hmm. Ms. Graham. Apperson Way. I'm sorry, that is not correct. Anybody else? Paul. Washington Street. I'm sorry. Tommy may as well, you have the money to play. <laughs> uh, um, Michigan Avenue. Uh, that is not correct. <laughs> the answer we were looking for is Superior Street. Ah. Yeah, Superior, yeah. There you go. Oh, uh, location, lo me again? Yes. Location, location, location <laughs> for 300. 
This entertainment venue in Kokomo originally opened in 1938 as the seashore. Cheryl. What is Kokomo Beach? That is correct. Woo on the board. Plus 300. It's all you. Cheryl. Oh, sorry. Location, location, location for 400. Rusheville was part of this county until a successful petition made it part of Howard County in 1859. Paul. Clinton County. That is correct. You're bored. Uh, let's go with location, location, location for 500. This person originally owned the float section of land that Kokomo uh, was eventually built on. Yes. David Foster. I'm sorry, that is not the answer ah. we're looking for. Cheryl. Mr. Richardville? That is not correct uh, either. Oh, man, I'm not chancing it. <laughs> <laughs> the answer we were looking for was Francis LaFontaine. Oh, oh wow. Yes. Wow. wow. We sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, it's your board. Or, I'm sorry, I've lost track of Yeah, I, I think it's it is fine board. still, yeah. So uh, let's do politics for 100. In 1948, this president made a whistle stop in Kokomo during the re-election campaign tour of the Midwest. Tom. Who is Harry Truman? That is correct. All right, Peter, let's go. Same category for 200. Upon his election in 1979, he was the youngest person ever elected mayor of Kokomo. Paul. Steve Daly. That is correct. Your board. Uh, let's go politics 300. This mayor of Kokomo was killed while supposedly robbing a mill in 1881. He was too early. He was way early. Tom, you were very early. I, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Paul, mayor you? Cole. That is correct. Uh, Henry Cole. Paul? Uh, politics for 400. This person, then a U.S. Senator, later elected president in 1888, spoke at the dedication of the Civil War Monument in Crown Point Cemetery in 1886. Paul? Woodrow Wilson. I'm sorry, that's not correct. <sighs> The answer we're looking for is Benjamin Harrison. Mm. Ooh. I got that. I would have got it wrong. I'm glad. Yeah, right. Let's go politics 500. Break. Let's do it. Politics 500. Politics 500. This resident of Alto, Indiana, was the running mate of William Jennings Bryan on the presidential ticket in 1908. He later served as a U.S. senator mm. from 1911 to 1916. Tom. Who is John Kern? That is correct. Yes. Wow. Great okay. job. That Great is answer. really good. Great. Thank you. That'll conclude the first portion of Jeopardy tonight. Looking over at the board, we have Tom in the lead with $1,300. Cheryl in second place with $300. And Paul right behind her at $100. <laughs> We're going to take a brief break from Jeopardy to watch a video presentation. And then we'll be right back for the second half of the game. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Peter, Mr. Trebek. Uh, in the uh, interlude between the two sections of Jeopardy, we wanted to share with you a project from 2020. This was a uh, revisiting of something that began in the 1980s. It was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. The Black Women of the Midwest Project collected manuscripts and photographic records of black women in Illinois and Indiana. Kokomo was among the number of communities where volunteers sought out women to share their memories and develop a collective history of their lives and culture. On March 15th of this year, 35 years after the initiative was underway, the Howard County Historical Society honored this work with Black Women of the Midwest Project Revisited, a retrospective exhibit and reception to honor local participants. And in this next slide, we're going to hear from one of the original coordinators, Ruth Temeny, who used to live in Kokomo. Um, and at this point, you can go ahead with the video. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining me for this glorious celebration of Black Women in the Midwest Project Revisited. How important it is to include her story into history. How important it is to recognize and celebrate our heroes. How important it is at this time to celebrate brave, bold, and fearless women, especially during National Women's History Month. February was Black History Month, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this presentation, which inspire, honor, and celebrate African-American achievements as we revisit the history of the Black women in the Midwest Project. Greetings from North Carolina. My name is Ruth Timoni, and I served as the coordinator of this two-year endeavor, beginning September 1984. At that time, I was teaching third grade in Kokomo Center Township Schools. Having been in the community for 12 years, I spearheaded and participated in several community-wide events, knew this was a supportive community, and had knowledge there were untold stories of the role Black women played throughout the history in this area. The purpose of the Black Women in the Midwest Project was to collect and preserve information and documents that recorded the historical experiences and achievements of Black women throughout the states of Indiana and Illinois. Dr. Hines received a small grant for the National Endowments of the Humanities when she became the director of the Black Women in the Midwest Project. Initially, it was to last three years and cover five Midwestern states. However, later, later narrowed down to the two states of Illinois and Indiana because of the funding. It was going to be very time consuming and an expansive project to undertake, thereby possibly needing an assistant. The adage, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And the name, Sharon Reed, came to mind. There was no hesitation in her willingness to serve as co-coordinator. According to an article printed in the Kokomo Tribune on February 1987, the Black Women in the Midwest Project was seated with the Indianapolis section of the National Council of Negro Women collected documents about the lives of black women in Indiana. Two school teachers delivered the materials to Dr. Darlene Clark Hines at the History Department of Purdue University. Along with Dr. Hines were Patrick Bitterman, coordinator, Donald West, program archivist for the Indiana Historical Society Museum, and Shirley Hurd, the Community Relations Consultant. An introductory meeting was held at the Kokomo Public County Library to inform the community of the scope of the project and to generate local support. The community people mostly, but not exclusively Black women, formed the grassroots base of collecting for the project. A few men were involved as well. My first interview was with Dr. Theodore Clark as he discussed the life of two sisters, Dr. Maggie Gaskin, who was the first black female doctor in Kokomo, and Ella Willerson. Continuous workshops and meetings were held as volunteers searched attics, basements, closets, grandma's trunk, shelves in churches, old hidden boxes, and found various historical documents and memorabilia, such as tattered newspaper clippings, church bulletins, journals and diaries, club meetings and minutes, photos, obituaries, yearbooks, 
church books of recorded minutes and financial plannings, programs of musical plays and open houses, bundle of letters, and family albums. The family Bible, which I know most of you probably had displayed on the coffee table in your homes, carried dates of births, deaths, marriages, and military services. As the word spread and more people were interested in the project, Sharon and I spent countless hours of scheduled home visits interviewing local families, friends, and acquaintances of those no longer with us. The Indiana Historical Society Museum agreed to house the collection. From Hubbard County, it's Holden file boxes dated as early as 1891 until 1985. The life achievement of 18 women was documented from these bits and pieces. Most women served as Sunday school teachers and were affiliated with several organizations such as the Women's Improvement Club, the Progressive Club, Temperance Group, NAACP, Order of the Eastern Star, and the Interracial Friendship Club. What a fantastic presentation that was. Well, thank you everybody for sticking with us. We're back for round two. Just to recap briefly again, Tom is in a commanding lead with $1,300. Commanding. Have Cheryl <laughs> following with $300. And again, Paul just behind her at $100. Paul, I'll turn the board over to you. Excellent. Let's do a home sweet home for $100. This college started holding classes in the Cyberlink Mansion in the fall semester of 1946. That was pretty close, but Paul, I think you had it just by a fraction. What is Indiana University Kokomo? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Paul. Uh, home sweet home for 200. These two daughters of Monroe and Sarah Cyberling had their weddings in the mansion. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is true? What is and true? And Emma. <laughs> Paul, still your board. All right, uh, let's uh, let's stick with it. Home sweet home for three hundred. This person was the longest term owner from nineteen fourteen to nineteen forty six of the mansion while it was a residence. I know. I know. Come on, Tom. I know. I know. Tom, Tom, Tom should George lose points for Kingston. that. Kingston. Kingston. Not who yes. I was going to guess anyway. I knew that. Can we roll the tape back? Yes. All right, let's do uh, Got to Make Money for 100. What it, this is what Fiat Chrysler Automobiles produces in Kokomo. Paul. What are transmissions? Correct. On fire. Still yours. Uh, let's do uh, Got to Make Money for 200. Kokomo Steel and Wire Company merged with two other steel concerns and became known as this on June 21st, 1927 and remained in business until February 1986. Cheryl. What is Continental Steel? That is correct. I have way more than $100. <laughs> working on, we'll get you caught up. We'll make sure you get all your money. <laughs> oh, my money's being suppressed over money. there, all those <laughs> answers I got right. I know. <laughs> all right, Cheryl, the board is yours. Uh, got to make money for 300 please. That was... This business, which was founded in 1888 and has been in operation ever since, provides its products to users around the world. One of its earliest customers was Tiffany Studios. Paul, I think you beat me before I finished it off, oh. but it's got to go to Cheryl. What is Kokomo Opalescent Glass? Perfect. <laughs> Cheryl. I'll say, got to make money for 400 please. This is the proper name of the glass business, popularly known as Greentown Glass. What is the Indiana Tumbler and Goblet Company? No. Cheryl. 
Got to make money for 500. This business, first opened in the 1860s, was the oldest in Howard County when it closed its doors for the last time in 2011. What is Armstrong Landon? Mm. Mm. Cheryl, it's still your board. Uh, home sweet home for 400. This person lived in the Cyberling Mansion from 1905 to 1914 and made his fortune selling patent medicine before moving on to real estate. I know. Um. Who is Franklin D. Miller? Wow, what a disappointment I am. I'm <laughs> feeling it. It's okay, Tom. You're going to be all right. All right, next category or question. Is uh, yeah, so you're bored. I'm sorry. Okay, home sweet home for 500 This person from Marion, Indiana, was the architect of the Cyberling Mansion. <laughs> Answer we were looking for a question is, who is Arthur LaBelle? All right, Cheryl, we're down to the last category. Where would you like to start? Uh, what a mix for 400. Libyan terrorists attacked the nuclear power plant west of Kokomo in this movie, which was filmed in town and premiered in 1988. Tom. What is Terror Squad? Yes. <laughs> I know my strengths. Okay, Peter, let's go for what a mix for 100. Come on. All right. Big money, big money. In 2003, this Howard County landmark was raised due to obsolescence and maintenance expense. Cheryl. What is the Kokomo Gas Tower? That is correct. Yeah. And Cheryl, just like that, the board's back to you. Uh, what a mix for 200, please. Palm Sunday of this year is when the deadliest tornado in Howard County history came through. Paul, I think that was you. Uh, what is... What is Rushville, Indiana? I'm sorry, we were looking for what year? Cheryl? Oh, what is 1965? What is 1965? There you go, Cheryl. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. With the assistant, yeah, Paul. Welcome. You're welcome. I'll do what a mix for 300, please. This Native American nation originally inhabited the land that eventually became Howard County. Paul. What are the Miami Indians? That is correct. <clears throat> All right. Last what a one. mix for 500. Oh, and it's that daily, daily double. double. Yeah. All right. How I'm you betting it all. All right. We'll let you bid up to 500 on that. I'm in. All right. It's a thousand bucks then. Oh. Let's do it. She became a minor pinup sensation during World War II oh, when yeah. a picture of her with <sighs> old Ben was sent to some Kokomo GIs. <laughs> that, Sorry, Tom, that's Paul's uh, Daily Double there. Whisper it, Tom. <laughs> Dang it. Okay. Uh, who is Mary Ellen Harnish? <laughs> yes. Who is Mary Ellen Harnish? Uh, yes. Yes. Of course. Of course. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We were looking for oh, Phyllis, Phyllis. Talbert, nay Hartzell. Of course, Phyllis. Of course it was. <laughs> Why didn't we get that? Uh, All right, folks. Well, that's going to bring us to Final Jeopardy. Okay. Now, the category for Final Jeopardy question will be African American History. For those of you in the positive, you can bet up to the amount of money that you have. If yes. you are in the negative, tonight we will let you bid up to the amount you are negative to see if you can break even. Okay. Please record your bids, and once you're ready, I will provide you with the answer or the question. Do we write down the answer too? Yeah, uh, yeah you'll write it. You'll have a separate sheet that you'll write down on once I give you the, the prompt there. Everybody have their bids recorded? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. These are the two names of the African-American settlements in Howard County's Irvin Township in the late 1800s. Tom, you got to write oh, your answer down for us here. Sorry, You'll I don't watch the music ends. It's seconds. a five-second delay. All right, 
Cheryl, with the lowest points here, we will start with you. What is your answer? Or how much did you bid? I'm sorry. Eight hundred. Eight hundred dollars. And what was your answer? What is Hall and Smith? Oh no, I'm sorry, that is not correct. Next, Paul, we'll move to you. Um, I bid uh, zero, which I think is what I have up there, and uh, I had Douglas as one of them. I'm sorry, that is not correct. And Tom, how much did you bid? Seventeen hundred. Yeah. And what was your answer? What is Bassett and Rush? That is correct. Nice. Wow. Okay. Tom, that brings your one-day winnings up to $3,400. Now, this unfortunately is not for real money. However, you have earned a free renewal of your Howard County Historical yeah, Society. Yeah, all right. Good job, Tom. Good job, Tom. If you divide that by 50, how many years do I get? I left my calculator in my other suit. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Once again, a round of applause for our contestants, please. Thank you all. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Thank you. Turn it back over to Dr. Hughes. <laughs> thank you all very much for coming, and thank all of you who have tuned in to watch. Uh, we want to, again, thank everybody that was a part of our evening. Uh, we had a lot of people coming in and substituting, and we appreciate that so very much. So with that, we will say good evening, and thank you all very, very much.